It Andrew. is recording now. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Well, welcome everybody, slightly late. Other apologies for absence. Uh, no apologies received. Any declarations of interest, either physically here or among members on screen? No? Thank you very much. Uh, I assume, are you introducing, Greg, the internal audit progress? Please, over to you. And by the way, you may gather some people are under the cosh to try to finish relatively quickly as well, I'm sorry to say. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you and uh, good evening. And I'll take the report as read to speed things up and very briefly take you through the highlights. So the progress report includes two reports um, that we finalised um, and um, we've uh, uh, also put within the progress report a couple of changes to the plan. So the community strategy and cyber audits have been deferred to next year when the council's own plans and strategies are going to be ready. So that makes sense in terms of waiting until those are, uh, are finished before we do the work. So the two reports very briefly uh, within the progress report, we have insurance, which was given substantial assurance for both um, design and effectiveness. Uh, we think very strong controls there, good arrangements, lots of good practice, regular inspections, reviews of cover, the council's learning learning lessons from, from um, uh, insurance claims. Two issues there, one around um, having a insurance risk strategy, which would make things more transparent uh, in terms of your risk tolerance, for example. So that would be good practice to have that, and that's been accepted. And secondly, a low priority around risk assessment reports being done by your insurance provider. Uh, they, they are being done, but they just haven't been kept up to date. So there's those two issues both accepted. And the second report uh, was on general ledger. Uh, again, positive report, substantial on design, moderate on effectiveness, um, generally good controls, accurate reconciliations, journals processed correctly, good procedures. The, the main issue was the one around, which I'm sure members are aware around the QL system, uh, which is impacting on customer billing, um, 30,000 orders awaiting billing. And obviously that needs to be addressed uh, in terms of the, you know, because it will have an impact. Uh, on the council's accounts and, and money receivable. Again, there is a plan in place that officers are working to, to get some sort of a fix uh, by April on that. Uh, and then some minor issues around journal documentation, reconciliation dates and so on, but they are minor and isolated incidents and we were happy to make those low priority. So those were the main points from the progress report as well as the sector update. And I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you very much indeed. I'm looking other do you want to please, Ros? Right. Hello. <laughs> Is that, can you hear me? All right. The screen's right. Okay. Yes. I mean, obviously, the the QL Agresso thing is 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 a, what of a concern. I have to say. Um, what is the likelihood that? Um, I mean, it's it's said by it's going to be completed by April. I think you said it's going to be redone. Um, what is the likelihood? I mean, I'm looking at Nigel of that overrunning at all beyond April. Yeah, the, the, the QR, QR system itself, uh, it, it's been well tracked sort of thing as to the problems we've had with that system actually. And, and currently we, we, we are, there are, there are two key milestones that we're heading towards. One is, first one is called steady state. And that is where all of the, all of the processes are in place, but they are being operated by what we call workarounds. So in other words, additional processes, additional resources to keep the system and the processes going. Um, that steady state um, position, the key milestone is looking to be reached by the end of February. Um, that will mean uh, the final piece of the jigsaw being we will be obtaining full financial information for ODS and indeed the council in terms of work undertaken by ODS. And that will be the final part of the jigsaw. In terms of what's known as business as usual, it is what it is basically where the system is being used as intended we are unlikely to get to that stage until about May time, back end of May at the earliest, actually. Um, at this point in time, everybody's getting their repair done. You know, we're taking repairs, ODS are doing the works, uh, suppliers are being paid. Um, what, we, what we haven't got, as say, is that financial information, basically. That will come from a steady state and say business as usual will be that latter one, basically. So 
at this point in time, I'm confident that we will reach those targets, basically, and in doing so, box off some of these issues outlined by uh, BDO. Can I come back? So yeah. you mentioned additional resources to keep things going. That was yeah. the phrase used. How much is that extra resources costing us? Uh, off the top of my head, uh, we put two uh, urgent decisions in that have been approved through the Chief Executive Powers in the region of 200,000, actually, uh, for the last, um, I'd say, best part of 12 month period, actually. Can I just ask one last question? So was was this um, was that seen as a significant risk then, really, that this would happen? And, and was there any mitigation in place? put in place before this happened this disaster i think it's fair to say that there, there will be a a wash-up session or a review that will be undertaken of the qr implementation was it seen as a major risk um i don't think at the time i think our understanding at the time that we were due to go live was that the the system was good to go and ready to go basically clearly when we pressed the button the system was not in that position and it is fair to say, and I know the chair has commented on, on this several times, there will be a review, an external review undertaken. And I'm pretty certain that review will come to this committee or scrutiny or one of those committees basically for, um, for review on, you know, in, in that sense. My chair suggests there it does come back to audience governors. It's a procedure that's obviously, you know, gone wrong. So I would suggest it does come back to this committee if possible, please. Yeah, that's fine. I, I can ensure that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you note that that will be a recommendation for the committee rather than BTO? Um, could I ask uh, one question, which is, well, two actually, but one is for the review of, uh, which I always find useful, the review of what's going on in local government. But the first one is, just this is to understand, it says on page 17, as the QL housing system is in a state of recovery interfacing with Aggresso, blah, blah, blah. Is that the same problem just in terms of housing repairs and this kind of stuff? So it's yes. just another yes. way of describing yes. the problem. Yes. Okay. The question I had, which is more for information and maybe to ask Nigel to comment on this on page 21 is, I mean, we know the delays in external audit and uh, there's somewhere the figure of 9% were completed by the due date. But um, the, uh, the audit for the coming year and going all the way through to, I'm just trying to see, for this uh, year is extended to November. And then we proceed to have, am I correct, five in which we're going to have back to the old September deadline. Is that true? How does it affect, if any way, the council's finance operations? I, I don't know whether, I mean, Bill was possibly going to pick some of this, some of this up, possibly uh, yeah. around the re review. Bill, do you want to come in? I'll, I'll pick that up now. Yes, I mean, we, are, um, we have got a change deadline to 30th September and for the fi following five years, end of September. As far as we're concerned, we're intending to uh, internally close the accounts and get drafts in the same sort of time scale. Um, now, then, um, but from an audit perspective, it's likely that, that will def will be pushed out um, closer to those dates. So, for next year or the current financial year that we're in, but for the next audit, um, we'll be looking at it being closer to the November date for external audit. The primary reason for all of this, these changes are around the pressures on external audit and their resourcing. Um, I think the other thing to note is that the government has promised 45 million extra funding over three years, but we don't know how that's going to be allocated or distributed. Um, but yeah, we await for some announcements from government on that one. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Yes, I, I question that uh, wonderful amount that national government uh, mentioned for, for audit uh, for, for local councils up and down the country. And then I looked at the more details and asked about the details. And I discovered that, in fact, it's going to be for 
um, training <laughs> purposes, and it's going to be spread through the whole of the country for all our councils. So it's going to be pennies, I think, when it finally gets to us. It's not going to be anything significant at all. Very disappointing. No, I was just going to, uh, I too look at the um, the BDO sort of uh, summary, basically, um, you know, uh, and I think it's a very useful summary, actually. I was just uh, reflective on the Omicron, Omicron grant boost uh, there, which mentioned, and and we were not one of the authorities that uh, did get a boost in our ARG, our additional restrictions grant scheme, of about 300,000. Uh, and indeed, we're, we're making plans to actually we've also got like a lot of authorities actually we've also got an additional grant um to to pay out around the omicron variant grant which is two around we estimate 2.8 million which has got to be paid out to approaching a thousand businesses um just to make the point there that the government are expecting us to pay that out by the 31st of march the applications in by the 18th of march and pay all that money out by the 31st of march and we have actually written to um, to Bayes and LGA to sort of um, to say how ridiculous that is. Um, would might be interesting to know from the committee's point of view that since the since the inception of the business grants in 2020, we we estimate that our fraud team has um, mitigated or staved off around 17 and a half million pounds of the payment of grants in fraudulent claims. Uh, with about two two thousand seven hundred claims against us, basically. So um, I think taking a little bit of time to pay these grants off has got to be the order of the day, and to be urged or told to pay them out in that in that time scale is 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 quite quite a challenge indeed, actually. But uh, that is what the government have set us actually. We just ask: Is there any penalty if we fail to disperse all that money? I think I think if the businesses haven't applied and uh, have have not been granted the application with all our due diligence checks that we need to make by the 18th of March, then they won't be entitled to the grant, and that's the problem that we're going to have. Um, you know, it's it's they are just unreasonable, and it, we're not the only authority to uh, make this observation. Their counter is, well, the businesses need you; they need you to pay the grant out. My counter is. But we need to pay the right businesses, and we need to pay them in a in in a in a manner which ensures due diligence, especially given the figures I've just mentioned. I suggest we just note our concern about this and quote the numbers to show that, with proper care, the fraud team can save actually the government uh, an awful lot of money, and that uh, we would like uh, serious consideration to make a more realistic deadline for this disbursement. I know it probably won't make any difference, but it might be worth doing as a recommendation. <laughs> sorry. Just, so, sorry, Nigel, could you just repeat the figure that we're, this council's receiving? Just uh, it's 2.8 2, 2. million 2. Uh, in, it's, it's called the Omicron variant grant. And we estimate there'll be about, about 800 businesses in the city that will be entitled to that actually. But we need to go through all the due diligence checks, basically, again. And uh, and that's the problem, really. Yeah, yeah. thank you. In, in page 21, um, said um, about the additional re restriction grant scheme, we still have, consults still have two, two, 250 million of previous allocation funding that remains unspent. Why why these the, the, this, this reasons? Why we still have this uh, funding i i would suggest part of it is because we you know they like us are doing the those due diligence checks actually um again the times i can't remember the time scales of the arg but again they would have been similar to i.e quite tight and what the government did on that particular one is to say only those that have met a certain threshold of spend are going to get an additional top up I'm thankful to say we were one of those authorities that got an additional top up of the additional restrictions grant. So we are the one of the ones that are helping our businesses. There are many that didn't, didn't, didn't get to that stage. And then they pile on another grant on top of us, actually, in terms of the Omicron variant grant and say, get that paid by the end of March. So uh, it's, you know, I accept a load of business out there that are struggling and desperately need that money. 
but we've got to pay it out in a way that protects the public purse actually and uh to say from from the figures i've got sort of thing that's what we are trying to do i'm going to say with an eye on the time um well, maybe thank you very much. I think we should be expressing pleasure with the um, substantial and there's only one moderate in this set. So I think that's very impressive. So please pass on to the relevant officers the praise. But thank you very much. And again, I think that summary at the end of that particular item is always very useful to read. It saves a lot of other reading. <laughs> thank you. And now um, on to the... So can may we as a committee note this? I assume people are in favour, yes? I don't see any against. Um, so move on to the follow-up, please. Okay, um, so there are only three recommendations to follow up, all to do with the company's oversight report. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, rather disappointingly, none of them have been implemented. So um, we are going with another revised date again with these recommendations. Um, I think to be fair, if you look at the commentary, there has been some movement on them and there has been some action. But, you know, obviously we would like to see these closed down as soon as possible and the council can move on to other things. Thank you. I'm going to invite Helen who is on the screen there to respond. I mean, in particular, Helen, if I may, um, at least one thing mentioned in December as being the time by which something was going to be complete. I just want to know, did you achieve that? And the others all say four days time. Is that realistic or what is a realistic and deliverable deadline yeah. for those items? Because the companies do matter to us in terms of revenue. <laughs> Over no. to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, good evening, everybody. So, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is to apologise for the fact that these um, actions haven't yet been um, completed. Um, just to say that the um, the work, the, the piece of work to actually make it happen is quite simple. So, the the you know once once we've got the information to update the, the job descriptions, it would then just be a process of. Um, consulting with the relevant post holders and then publishing them so of itself that is not a, a big piece of work we're currently at the moment just trying to nail what the what the specific information is that need to go on those job descriptions so we've got that in sight at the moment I've got my eyes all over this now and I think the information that we gave to um, colleagues um, was that we would have this done by the 1st of March and I think I think that's entirely doable so um, I, yeah we're on we're on, I'm on the case so um, apologies and I just hope you can take my assurance that we're on the case of this and hopefully this will, will drop off and you won't see it again. So does that mean in practice we'll do one more crossing out for um, January and put an, an end yeah, February I, yeah, delivery? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, to be honest, I mean, yeah, yeah, that that that's right. Yeah, I don't think we gave the Feb the, the January date. Um, I think on the on the piece of paper I've got, I said we would have this done by the first of March. I think that is since yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw the agenda. So yeah, yeah, no, lovely. Okay. Um, Sorry, I was just going to add. Obviously, please. the next the next committee meeting will be then, so we'll obviously have that followed up yeah. for the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay. I was just going to check the next date of them for this committee, so it will definitely be available to us and for the benefit of the companies by the time we next meet. Yeah. What, what date are you meeting? It's the 11th of I'm it's sorry, 11th I didn't April. That. Oh, yeah. 11th oh, of April. oh, my goodness. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. See, the other Nigel on the screen has his hand up. Nigel. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Helen, for doing a mea culpa, because this has been on the agenda for a bit of a while. Yeah. I mean, the reason why it's important is that sometimes we go to company meetings wearing our various scrutiny hats, and it, and it appears to me that sometimes officers are a little bit confused about which role they're, they're, they're performing 
in the said meeting and also members are confused too. So this is important. Actually, it's not just a bit of sort of housekeeping. No. We are tidying up. Is actually defining clearly their roles when they have their day job and then they have a role vis-a-vis the company. Um, they may sit on a company board. A number of them are doing that at the moment. Um, so I think it, it is really, really important and, that, we, that, we, that we do this. So I just reinforce the fact that we can't just let this slide any longer. No, I know. I completely understand that. And to be quite honest, that's why I don't just want to take the wording that's in the audit report we need to actually make sure that whatever um, actions or um, behaviours or conduct that we want to put in there is relevant and specific to each role um, so I completely take that on board um, Councillor Chapman and I hope you know that that's that's what I'm trying to nail at the moment. Okay well we have your assurance that it will all be yeah good <laughs> by April and we're going to hold yeah. it to you, all right. I, yeah, and so you should and I'm just really sorry that it's 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 slipped under the radar but I understand. I'm, I'm okay. on the case. If that you. makes you feel any better. Well, having worked with you quite a lot in the past, usually when you say that, you will actually deliver it. So I've got to trust you. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope they're not going to minute that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Your hand is still up, Nigel. Is that your earlier hand? Thank you. I'm going to suggest that we note. Helen's promise, and uh, upon pain of death, and that we <laughs> proceed to note this with the revised deadlines, and for sure it will be down on as complete by the time we have our next meeting. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we note this report, and let's move on to important item, which we have to do really today, which is setting the council tax base. Is this going to be, uh, I imagine it's over to Bill on the screen, is that correct? Do you want to introduce this briefly? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, this report's brought to the committee to consider and approve the council tax base, which is used for set, then setting the council tax for 22-23, um, based on the number of dwellings in the area that we actually estimate will, will be active as it were, during that year. Um, there is actually a reduction in the council tax base on this one um, compared to 21-22. Um, if you go to paragraph 12 of the report, you can see a table that's got a breakdown of the reasons for the change in the council tax base from the previous year. Uh, the key areas of impact really are the level of exemptions and also the council tax support caseload. Um, as it also outlines in the report in paragraph six and nine, the increases in properties have been negated by the numbers of student dwellings, which attract exemptions. Um, on appendix one, this shows a breakdown of the council tax base calculation overall, and appendix two further break this, breaks this down by parishes and the unparished areas. Um, so I'll put this across to yourselves for questions and then hopefully approval. Thank you very much. Maybe, may I kick off with just a couple of questions which are posed by this. One, I looked through the bands and to my surprise, band H had as a percent of exempt, when you look at the final number and the number of dwellings, had the highest proportion that were exempt just as a proportion. And I just wonder, how is a new student hall of residence treated? Is that one dwelling or how, I mean, I'm just wondering, is it that we have sizable numbers of these large units, which are actually many people, but count as one? I just wonder how, how it's calculated. It's likely that the band H ones will be, um say people living on their own that have got um, those exemptions. Um, uh, there are various exemptions. I think the key one, which I've pulled out are the student ones, that's because that's the biggest impact on the council tax base. Um, individual dwellings are banded as the actual dwelling itself. Um, so it really depends on how the, um, the student dwelling is actually 
made up, it's likely that they'd be in the lower bands and a number of them rather than in band H. Okay. I mean, I just... <coughs> I just wonder because I guess it's a bit of a fuzzy thing, but anyhow, I looked at that band. Um, the only other question on page 37, um, it mentions the long-term empty premium that you can get up for more than 10 years to charging three times the council tax. That is the penalty. And I just wondered, do you have some indication of any response from the owners triple council tax bill. Um, do they eventually get them occupied? Um, are there compulsory purchase powers that the council could exercise in order to bring these back into use? Can we raise it to 400%, 1,000%? I mean, what can we do in order to penalise the owners and get these properties back into use? I think Nigel Kennedy will answer. <laughs> Yeah, so so looking at that position at the moment, so obviously we 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 can es under the legislation we can escalate up to three hundred percent. That is our maximum. Um, we have uh, as of now we have eighty two properties on hundred percent, i.e. they've been empty for more than two years. We have about eighteen properties on two hundred percent, i.e. empty for more than five years, and we have nine properties on the three hundred percent, i.e. empty for more than ten years or more. Um, having had a chat with the um, Revs and Ben's team. When we raise these issues, and we do, we do frequently contact um, the owners of these properties through our empty prone property officer. Um, when we raise the issue and say you do realise you're paying three hundred percent, some do say, "Okay, I oh, will get on and try and get it back into use." Others just ignore us and carry on paying the three hundred percent. Actually, and you may be aware there are a couple of properties in the city where we just don't get any information whatsoever. And um, that's an unfortunate state of affairs. We are continually reviewing that every year. We, we run exercises over our empty properties, not least of all, because we, if we can convert them to occupy the system, we benefit from a grant called new homes bonus. Um, there is some debate as to whether that grant will carry on by, by the government, um, but it's still in place for this year. Um, so we continually monitor the situation. But uh, yeah, some respond to us, some just ignore us, um, and some just say, yeah, thanks for that, but unfortunately I can't get this back into use at this point in time. They just follow up on compulsory purchase. I don't know, has the council, I would have hoped that leaving it empty for more than 10 years or even five might be grounds for starting compulsory purchase. We, we have been a number of properties in the past um probably a handful actually where we have instigated those cpo orders um clearly we we would if we do that that's quite a big step we would need to find the money to actually buy them in the first place what we would hope to do is do a back-to-back -back sale of some sorts actually so we are not left with the property basically some of those properties have, have been because of the state of disrepair um, and say we've done some in the past, we haven't done any of late. And when they get to that three year or, or the, the 10 year empty stage, it is because there are difficult circumstances behind it, basically. And the ones that we've done in the past, it's been a real long process to go through the legals to get to a CPO. Um, so it's not unheard of, but it's not without its uh, problems to get to that position. Could I just to pursue that? Because this does stick out <laughs> as uh, incredible. Would it be possible uh, to have a confidential report about, let's say, just focusing in the first instance upon these over 10 year properties so that we could understand, is it dilapidation? Is it just we cannot trace the owner? Is it just stroppiness on their part? Just to understand whether the council could be more aggressive in pushing this action you know, this compulsory purchase. Yeah, we can do that, Chair, for probably the next committee, actually. Yeah. Um, yes, if I could. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you for that information, actually, on, on page 37, that detailed information. It's, uh, it's very interesting, actually. Um, my question, in fact, actually, was what's the collect collection rate on these empty homes? So, and I mean, you've mentioned um, 
people that don't respond to 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 us i mean have we got i mean i can think in my you know in in nearby division we've got um the infamous um old high street in headington that's been going what over 16 years now <clears throat> empty in a conservation area um but just just out of interest do you have a, a collection rate on empty properties i i don't but i mean that can be something that i will include in the report basically so thank you yeah that'd be okay. useful no worries Any other questions from committee members? Otherwise, may we thank, please, yes. Apologize, sorry, um, on page um, 39, the tax in parishes there, um, and it mentioned that in addition, there are only very minor numbers on newly built dwellings over the last 12 months. Um, I just wondered what was considered as minor Might be one for Bill if he's there. <laughs> so we'll go to you afterwards, Amar, after this question is answered. Thanks. Sorry, I was just getting myself to page 39. Yeah, I mean, the, the actual minor is what it, it's what it says. If you, if you look at Appendix 2, you can see that there are um, very few in the parishes that are new dwellings. Um, I think for, I think, yeah, so we've got new dwellings in the main area, but I'm just thinking it's not even mine. I think it's, uh, I don't think there were actually any, so I think that's been miswritten yeah minor means none in this case I think uh, Ros seems to be lacking that page, but uh, I can, here we are. You can have another copy. But I take your point when you look along the row for estimated new dwellings, you can see they're, they're normally zero, <laughs> which I think explains the comment. Amar, you had your hand up. Um, you appeared briefly on the screen with your name and a hand. Please. Thank you, Chair. A couple of questions, if I might. So one is just to follow up on this um, empty property uh, surplus, if that's the right word. Um, your question was, the, you know, could it be increased above a certain threshold? And Nigel's answer was, that's set. Is the timing also set? So if we can't increase above the 300%, can we get to 300% sooner than 10 years? Uh, that's my first question. Maybe I'll let Nigel take that, and then I've got a follow-up question as well, please. Oh, but I didn't catch it all, actually. I, 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 it, should I, should I, hang on, it might, it might just be my setup here, my apologies. Uh, my internet's not so good today. I was asking the empty property surplus, um, you had said that the rate is set, but is that, can the timing be brought forward? So instead of waiting 10 years to get to 300%, can you bring that yeah. forward? Okay. No, no, unfortunately, the legislation only allows us to put to, bring in the 300% once the property has been vacant for more than 10 years. Okay, thank you. My, my, follow, uh, my, 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 my other question, uh, the non-collection in the report, it suggests that um, historically uh, it has been 2%, but more recently it's been 4%. Um, but there's a suggestion that 2% um, was accepted as a, as a figure for an estimate for the next year. And I just wondered how realistic that was given the rising uh, cost of living and uh, rising energy costs that are coming, but whether we think uh, 2% is uh, a reasonable estimate or whether actually it's more likely to be higher than that. I think it's fair to say for this this financial year, given the pandemic, has been really difficult to sort of hold that, collect, that non-collection rates at 2%. Um, I think it is realistic as we start to hopefully come out of the back of the pandemic I think it is realistic to build in uh, 2% going forward. And that's what we've done 
in the budget and obviously reflected in this paper. Thanks, Nigel. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members? If not, may I suggest that we agree with the proposal? Um, any objection among committee members? No? So thank you very much and thank you, Bill, for introducing that. Um, then we come on to item six, which is uh, risk management. Bill again. Okay, over to you, Bill. Yes, yeah, so well, um, risk management report, I'll skip over a lot of it. Um, the uh, corporate risk register, the number of red risks has stayed the same at three. Um, those risks that are read are outlined at paragraph nine on the report. Um, on service risk registers, the number of red risks have reduced by two down to six. Uh, the red risks are again are outlined, outlined in the report at paragraph 15. Um, paragraph 18 of the report outlines the areas that the risk management group have been working on. So they're all listed there. Um, the, then in the appendices, the corporate risk register is shown at Appendix A and Appendix B. Appendix A shows purely just the risks and their scores. But if you go to Appendix B, that kind of breaks them down into more detail, showing the controls related to those risks. Um, so on Appendix B, you'll see the risk and then the controls relating to it underneath that risk before you get to the next risk. Um, as far as, and I think it was mentioned last uh, audit and governance, what control have we got over these risks? Um, it does vary. I think the ones which probably on the corporate register council has more limited influence over are local government reorganisation, negative impacts of climate change and terrorism. Um, although for all of these, there are controls and mitigations that can be put in place. Um, climate change, you can't necessarily deal directly with the fact that there might be a flood, but we can put in measures that reduce the council's carbon footprint and things like the, um, the zero emission zone, etc. So there's influence that the council can make on the risks, but not necessarily directly control them in their entirety. Um, so I'll pass it over to the committee now for consideration. Um, thank you very much. I mean, the, you've in a way addressed what's my main question. Some of these risks are beyond our control. I would say, um, you know, economic growth, we're not going to be able to do very much about the national economic uh, policy and environment. Um, is, would it be helpful to try to, I mean, maybe this is overkill, distinguish, I mean, having a lot of red risk, maybe it'd be nice to know which ones are essentially just a fact of life we have to live with and we cannot do very much to mitigate. I mean, you did partly address this and then others where we have, and you would probably be as well placed as anyone to judge, we have some significant degree of ability to mitigate these effects mm. because at least it would allow us, rather than seeing this list, which tends to repeat itself time and again, to get a sense of how we're dealing with things we can control. I don't know if that's a fair question. Well, I think the difficulty there is on uh, on the economic side of things. Um, although we can't deal with the national picture as such, there are things that we can do locally and there are things being done by council officers in order to promote the locality. Um, so I, th I think to sort of, to just remove them, that does risk that those, if you pardon the pun, risk those becoming a sort of almost a lower priority. So we can certainly try and do an indication of which ones are more influenceable. I've just made up a word than others, um, if, if that's what you wish. But it's just that I don't want 
necessarily risks to kind of be dropped off the radar entirely because there are things that we can do, albeit in a more limited sense. I mean, I think I'm just suggesting to split them among the, because we only ever look at the red ones in any detail, you know, the rest just get, I mean, they are there, but we don't look at them. I suppose I would suggest that the red risks at the, at the risk of uh, splitting it even more. One has ones over which we have some significant degree of control and others which are risks that are generic almost in the system. We recognize they exist, but there is not terribly much we can do as a district council. I mean, would that be a fair yeah. way of dividing? I'm not saying they're not red, but they are there and they just are there. I think probably the best way forward would be to split them in the report, whereby you know, when we list the risks, we sort of try and um, sort of list ones which we've got more control of and these are the ones which we've got less control of in future, if that helps. Yes, I think that's maybe what I had in mind. I don't know if other committee members agree, but you know, a lot of these are clearly there every time. And one wonders, you know, so how much control do we have over them? what mitigation measures could we seriously introduce? I mean, is that acceptable? I'm looking at now. No, I, I think I think that's a um, that's a good compromise. Actually, I think I think if we if we flag in the report those which we probably uh, have um, our, within our control, as opposed to those that we predominantly aren't. As Bill says, I think there are. At the margins, basically, uh, elements of control on things like climate change. Clearly, we can do our bit in terms of going to zero carbon, things like economic development sort of thing. We can do our bit. Um, but some of that is, is, is largely outside our control sort of thing. So I think if there are split in the tables that we, we bring forward in the report, Bill, then I think uh, that's, you know, that's where I would see we good. Yeah. yeah. I think Ros wants to name. Nigel Chapman has his hand up. Nigel. Yeah, um, I, I hear you and I agree with James, really. I mean, for me, what really matters is what, do, what can we control and how far do the mitigations impact the residual risk? That's the central question always with risk registers for me. Uh, and um, let's say the case of climate change. We have a whole series of initiatives, don't we, around climate change, which are our initiatives. And what I'm really interested in is how far they are, they, they are running well and how far they are at risk of not working and all those sort of things and how far they've put mitigation in place to make sure they work better or well from the first instance. So that's kind of where I come from. That's the bit that my eye always goes to because it's what we can control, to go back to your point, James. But to have sort of, you know, overarching economic risks about tourism in the city, I mean, sorry, you know, we're not writing a book about this. We're trying to control what we can control. We're trying to mitigate what we can mitigate. And that's what, the, in the end, is the principle that should be applied here. Otherwise, you sort of mix up massive external factors and internal controllable factors in a muddle. And you, you're not much the wiser in the end, because you always have to keep on unpacking where, where the, the influences and forces are. And that's a massive kind of intellectual exercise, which you don't want to be doing. And then I just want to know whether what we are saying we're going to do is working or not. That's the, and that's what the public want to know, by the way, as well. And I think the rest of it is sort of, you know, for the academics and the theorists. I'm sorry to be a bit grumpy, but that's why I think about it. Ros, you want to add something? Thank you. Um, interesting concept of, uh, of changing how you look at the, the risk registers. Um, I think factors, you know, are important and then what we do recognise as a council, okay, there are things that might be out of our control as such, but we need to register those as a risk for the people, good people and businesses uh, of Oxford. So I wouldn't like to see that, that go, the change be just, you know, what we can do locally mitigating. We have to recognise that there are external risks to each council throughout the country, I'd have said, um, and we have to recognise those and note those and be aware of them. Well, well, OK, Ross, I'm happy to compromise, but I suppose what I'm looking for is a focus on in the end. 
the, the, the bigger focus is on, on our policies and our strategies and are they working and are you know how far are they mitigating the risks and have we got any concerns therefore about the way they're working that's that's my point of entry but i'm happy to have the overarching context as you put it as well i'm not disagreeing with you nigel what i'm saying is that we shouldn't lose sight no, no, i think we're agreeing entirely here yeah. yeah i think the proposal at least i thought actually what i was favoring was that we continue to list what we see as the major, i.e. red risks, but that we distinguish within them between those we feel we have significant control over and those which are in the, as a fact of life, which we know are out there and that we show that we're aware of them. That's but Brexit. yeah, is there? Yes, I mean, like for instance, Brexit. For instance, yes. Brexit, you know, it is having an impact uh, already uh, on our good systems and businesses in Oxford City. Yes. Um, we're seeing delays with, with deliveries and so forth. That is something that's outside of our control, but does affect the good people of Oxford and, our, and businesses of Oxford. And I think we have to be aware of that. And I think we have to have that on our, our risk register. Okay, I think we've agreed on the principle. Are there any other points that we would like to make about this? Or may we please note this report? Thank you. And then on my agenda, it says statement of accounts, um, verbal update on the statement of accounts, which is over to Bill again. Is this correct? It is indeed. Um, and probably my colleagues at EY might want to come in and say something if I haven't covered it. Um, so firstly, I need to sort of set a bit of context here um, around where we're at with the with the audit process and what's actually being looked at um, now during 2020 as the committee knows the council received a large number of grants from the government in relation to the covid 19 pandemic the grant conditions for these grants was in many cases poor non-existent or incomplete um, for instance it wasn't clear whether the balances had to be returned or not until we then then get a subsequent notification from the government that they want a reconciliation and return of monies. The reason that's significant is that there's a different accounting treatment for grants depending on whether they're principal or their agent. Now, if principal means we can decide how the money is spent. Agent means we're acting on behalf of somebody else and it's all predefined as to um, who's going to get the money and how much. Um, and so agent grants must be accounted for solely on the balance sheet because they're never actually our money. They're always the, the granting body's money. Um, and the principal grants are the ones that we actually account for in revenue. Um, we also had an additional problem that uh, there were grants actually with the same name and some of which were agent and others were principal. So it wasn't entirely helped by that. So I think um, what's actually happened at a national level is Ernst & Young have kind of reviewed all of these grants and we've come up with a, um, a, an approach for, for that firm as to this is how those accounts, those grants ought to be dealt with in the accounts. Um, to ensure a consistent, consistent accounting methodology for all of their clients. Um, so in turn, we've worked with them, with our external auditors, and then gone through all of our grants. The culmination of that is that we've had to move some of the grants which were previously being accounted for in revenue into the balance sheet. That's then had a... a knock-on effect onto materiality because one of these grants was actually quite significant in size. Um, so materiality levels means that it changes the, um, the actual audit sampling, uh, the levels of audit sampling. So we've had an increase in audit samples. Um, Ernst & Young have actually sent us those revised samples and we're currently working through them, almost got to the end of those actually, and, because they're in this sort of um, follow-up stage from Ernst & Young. Um, so I think overall there's no impact on the council's 
revenue position in the statements, but it, it's been quite a lot of work going through all of these uh, different grants and um, sort of reallocating them between the income and expenditure account and the balance sheet. Um, so that's that's really where we're at, and at the moment um, we're just sort of liaising on individual follow-up queries with Ernst and Young. Uh, I don't know whether Adrian wants to come in on anything there. Yes, Adrian, would you like? I can't. Now I can see you on our screen. Would you like to comment, please? You're still on mute. Okay. Yeah. So I think you know the, the summary that Bill's given us. I think is a fair reflection. I think. Um, our assessment across a number of our councils has agreed with Bill's uh, you know, viewpoint in terms of it has been very difficult in some instances to actually determine uh, from the documentation that's been provided through central government. Um, I think a lot of the grants, and similar to what Nigel actually talked about earlier, there was kind of a, a large rush to kind of an, a, a kind of very determination to kind of get a lot, a lot of money out to businesses and rightly so, but actually in doing that, I think a lot of the core documentation support and that was very, very poor. So as Bill has said, you know, we, we, we looked at that and actually I think there was a, a 43 million adjustment to come out of the income and expenditure statement. Um, and that obviously had a big impact. I think it reduced our materiality by um, close to a million pounds or approximately 20% of its original value. Uh, so we had to do a large exercise to actually go back through all of our accounts, uh, reassess some accounts as being significant, which had previously been classified as insignificant. And then we had to make an assessment to see where we needed to take extra samples. So I think in total, we're looking at a total um, additional samples of just over 100. Um, we're kind of coming to the conclusion of looking at those. And we do have some uh, do some of uh, outstanding samples and queries that we're kind of working through this week. Uh, so our, our view would be that in the next week or so, we should be coming to conclusion of the additional work we've had to do as a result of the, um, uh, removing some of the grants out through from the income and expenditure and into the balance sheet. Um, but as I say, I think um, just in terms of the national contact context, I know Councillor Fry, you originally touched on that in terms of the pressure uh, on individual finance teams and also audit firms as well. So I think um, this is something that we're seeing and, and certainly a large number of errors throughout, not just in the Oxford City Council accounts, but also across a large number of other bodies as well. Where actually uh, the accounts still aren't um, certified for the 2021 uh, audit year, and I think you know that's a, probably a reflection in terms of the additional work and a lot of the pressure that's coming through finance teams. And as Nigel just talked about with this latest Omicron grant and trying to get that out within, you know, effectively a two-week window at the end of the financial year, when finance teams are under a lot of pressure, it certainly puts in context, um, you know, certainly that pressure and also kind of all of the re the rest of the the business as usual in the working environment that teams have been working on over the last few years. So um, as I say, we're, we're trying to work through the outstanding queries as quickly as possible to try and reach a conclusion with a viewpoint to try and agree where we are um, on the outstanding pieces in the next week or so. Um, and then we'll start looking towards concluding the rest of the outstanding pieces, such as uh, the value for money commentary, uh, which I've been trying to write uh, in the last week or so. So the value for money commentary is a new piece, um, a new feature of the value for money conclusion this year. Um, it's much more, um, there's much more commentary in there in terms of um, our outputs and that's something that will be new. And we'll be sharing that with both Nigel and Bill uh, to get their viewpoints in the next week or so uh, to, to ensure that the output from that, that we report in the public documents consistent uh, with the kind of considerations of the council and also the, the operations of the council over the last uh, 12 months or so for the financial year 2021. Um, so yeah, happy to take any questions. Anybody has any in terms of some of the practicalities of the audit work? Could I ask just one question, which I know has arisen before? An earlier reason for delay was said to be reconciling or consolidating the accounts from the companies with yeah. the council itself. Um, am I right in assuming not the issue now? It's really what's been created by the treatment of the grants that's created this extra workload and that's uh, the delay is that fair yeah i think to be fair the, the the additional work has obviously kind of created the delay to be fair to the group we still i think we received the last of the documentation actually just last week on the group accounts so i think group consolidation still remains an issue and certainly if we're working towards uh the november deadline and then moving back to september 
I think that will be that will put significant pressure on that. Uh, so I think you know it still hasn't gone away, but I think the fact that we now have this delay as a result of the the reclassification of the grants has meant that it's probably not as prominent as prior years. Um, so I think we still need to kind of liaise and kind of discuss with Mazars in terms of um, the practicalities of how quickly they can actually consolidate and do the group work. Um, Abil, I don't know if you've got any viewpoints on that in terms of just the timelines on the group audit and then trying to tie that in with the council audit as well. Yeah, I mean, that's um, that's something we're looking at more closely this year, obviously, because we've been having these uh, these timing issues. Um, and trying to actually link the um, the work of Mazars into the work of EY and trying to get resources in place. Because one of the issues is that um, all auditors are stretched. They book out slots for doing their work. And if, for whatever reason, something misses those slots, you then have to wait for other people to become free to pick up that work. Um, so we're trying to sort of be a bit more granular about the timings. I'm looking to see if the, yes, Ros. Sorry, can I just confirm, um, Adrian, did you say, say the figure and the adjustments was 43 million needing adjustments within the accounts? Uh, that's correct, yeah. 43 million? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. was that the whole of the grants that we received in the, in, in the year or was that... Oh. Um, part of the grants no, no so yes so i was going to say yeah it's generally part of the grants and um it's not actually changed the kind of accounting for the amount we've spent it's actually moving the expenditure and the income out of the revenue account into the balance sheet so it's purely where it's actually shown um rather than any substantive figures as it were that hit the bottom line Um, any other hands up? I mean, could I ask just a practical question? I hope we will finally have the accounts ready before we have the next meeting of this committee, which isn't until April. Um, if so, and I'm looking at uh, officers, do we need to do as we've done in previous years and agree that in order to get it signed off as we would like to as soon as possible, that it is delegated to, I guess it's you, Nigel Kennedy, and myself as chair of the committee to sign off on the accounts once they're finally ready. It means we won't, as a committee, have a chance to look at them. But the point is, I don't think we want to wait until April. What would I'm going to ask Nigel Kennedy what he suggests. I think in, the, in, in respect of the in respect of last year's account, so the one with the, yeah, I mean we've already I believe we'd already taken that decision, Bill. Uh, I think for recollection, in order and governance, it is delegated it, downwards, is it not? I don't think it was formally delegated downwards. Obviously, the committee did actually consider the accounts to a level. Um, we okay. have actually said that we might put on some form of a training session. Yeah. But uh, yes, I don't so, think timing-wise that's going to necessarily work for 2021. Okay, so let's, I think we probably just need to check the decision basically made. I thought it was, but if it's not, then yeah, you're suggesting that it does need to be delegated down to me and you basically. But if we get Alice to check whether that was done previously, actually, I'm talking a few months back. If it's not, then I think that's a sensible suggestion, actually. Just to pick up Bill's comment as well, that, that we, we will be trying to set some training up because that was part of what we discussed as well with this committee. I think my recollection is similar to Bill's. I think we discussed it, but since it was still rather uncertain, I'm not sure we actually went that far. But is it acceptable to the committee that if we haven't already agreed to delegate to the Section 151 officer and myself, um, on behalf of the committee to sign off on the accounts, um, if we haven't already done so, that we agree that we will do so, so that we can sign it off before we next meet. Is that acceptable? I think that's a good way to get it uh, over the line. Chair, Chair if I could just um, interrupt. Um, it, the, la the resolution of the last committee was actually to authorise the chair of the committee to sign the accounts after any emerging non-material changes were included. Um, I don't know if that assists. It's 
definitely sounds as though you you did it last time. Yeah, I think there's then that question about non-material mm. um, because it's non-material on the net position. So if the committee is happy that that, that would stand, I think we probably ought to get clarification in a resolution that the committee is happy with that. If so, may I propose such a resolution? <laughs> any objection? I do not see any from the members I can see either on the screen or sitting next to me. So maybe you could note that, uh, Alison, make, make that uh, part of the minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that update. And we look forward to getting the final accounts um, in place and so finally, we come on and we need to approve the minutes from last time. Um, I think you were absent, is that correct, last time? Um, do any of the people who were present, and I see some here and on the screen, have any comments on what was said there? To me, it looks like a fair summary. There is under item 19, there is the question about the statement of accounts, um, annual governance statement and the like. I think that is all there. Um, so uh, maybe approve it? Yeah. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, quicker meeting than usual, but uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot when we come back in April. And uh, the next meeting is on the, I've, I've lost it already, the 11th, I think, yes, of April. So with that, I thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Bye.